Welcome to this podcast on uh, Easter, uh, the, the Gospel reading for Easter 5, Series A, which is uh, John chapter 14, verses 1 to 14. I'm Dr. Charles Gieschen here at Concordia Theological Seminary. Uh, this is uh, in Easter 4, which we um, looked at last week. You had a little bit of a transition from some of the focus on the proclamation of um, of the resurrection of Jesus to Good Shepherd uh, theme. And in Easter 5, 6, 7, you have a little bit more of that theme uh, from readings from John, even though we're in Series A uh, in Easter season, there's a lot of readings from the Gospel of John. You have more of the theme on Jesus leaving, namely um, his ascension, his going to the Father, and the fact that he will send the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, uh, we'll see that in the weeks ahead. But already in this text, it's, it's set in the uh, farewell narrative, the night before Jesus um, gave his life. Uh, but it's also preparing the disciples for when he would actually, after he had risen uh, and been with his disciples for 40 days, when he would go to the Father, when he would ascend and, and to be with the Father. So it's really um, a wonderful text preparing us for Ascension Day and Pentecost in terms of what Jesus is saying. Uh, a couple of other things. Uh, in this text, we have another one of those ego I me sayings, namely where Jesus says, um, and we, we see it um, uh, a little bit later uh, in this text, where Jesus is talking about, it's right here, ego I me, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We saw one of these last, or we saw uh, one set of these last week. I am the gate. Uh, it was twice repeated in chapter 10. Here in chapter 14, we have another one of these ego, I, me uh, sayings where John is talking about, or Jesus is talking about, he is the way, the truth, and the life. It's the I am statement with a predicate, uh, a predicate nominative construction. Uh, here, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So that is really an important a thematic um, center of the text, namely in verse 6. And we will emphasize that as we go on, but it's so important in terms of your preaching. Uh, Jesus as the way to the Father. A theme already introduced last week with the theme, I am the gate. If anyone enters through me, Jesus is the way to, to fellowship, the way to salvation, the way to communion with God. Let's move to the Greek text and translate away. We have 14 verses. Uh, you have this language of Jesus, uh, in, a little earlier in the farewell discourse, Jesus speaking about departing, leaving, causes the disciples to be fearful about the future. And uh, this is true even as we are in the Easter season, Jesus uh, ascending. What does that mean for the life of the church? Well, Jesus assures us that uh, we don't need to fear. He will continue to be present. It's just in a different way than standing before us with his flesh and blood um, uh, before us. Here you have um, the, um, the language of, of let not your heart be troubled. Uh, so here this, uh, uh, you have the present imperative with a negative, so it's a negative command. Let not your heart be troubled. Jesus knows, as he's talking about, no longer being physically with his disciples. They're fearful. He's calming them down. He's comforting them. Uh, this is actually wonderful assurance of how Jesus comforts us uh, even though he is, his physical presence, uh, he has ascended and reigning, he is assuring us uh, that we, uh, he will continue to be present, he will continue to, to take care of us. Uh, and during this Easter season, as we go to Pentecost, a wonderful promise. Let not your hearts be troubled. And then the call to believe. Uh, again, you have the imperative. Believe in God. And then a chi in me believe. So you have believe repeated twice here, and I think this is an absolute 
amazing statement where Jesus calls upon them to believe in God, but then follows it up, and I, you could actually translate this, namely, to believe in God is the same thing as believing in me. Why? Because Jesus is Lord and God, even as Thomas, we just heard that in the Easter 2 Gospel, confesses Jesus to be both Lord and God. So to believe in God is to also believe in Jesus, because Jesus is none other than the Word in flesh, God in flesh. Uh, and uh, uh, one can say that uh, this is expressed beautifully here. Uh, we shouldn't view it as um, somehow it's, it's uh, unfaithful to the God of Israel to believe in Jesus. No, it's actually being faithful to the God of Israel because Jesus is the God of Israel in human flesh, the eternal Son in human flesh. Then this comforting image to calm their, their troubled hearts. Uh, a lot of people can say, don't uh, worry, don't let your hearts be troubled. Jesus gives us a solid reason why we need not let our hearts be troubled. He, the imagery of his father's house. So in my father's house are many rooms. So this image of rooms and many of them is that there is a place for all of us. There's a place for, for all of God's people. And that, um, that he um, has gone to prepare a place for us. Uh, but the many rooms is the imagery that we all have a special um, place in, in God's eternal kingdom. Very comforting image. Uh, and then he assures them, you have a lot of conditional sentences, namely the if-then sentences, conditional sentences. Here's the first one. If not, um, I would have, this is a contrary to fact, I would have... Um, uh, said this to you, namely, if this wasn't true, that in my father's house are, are many rooms, uh, I would have uh, told you, because what is he doing? I am going to prepare a place. The imagery of many rooms, the image of a special place for you uh, is a, a beautiful, comforting image. Jesus isn't leaving us to, uh, to get uh, you know, rid of uh, uh, contact with us, no. He is, is on a special part of his mission. He's accomplished his earthly work. He will now continue his uh, eternal work of being the heavenly high priest. And he is preparing a place for all of his people to have eternal communion with him and resurrected glory. And that's uh, the image here of preparing a place. And that's uh, a reference to, obviously, uh, the many rooms that are in the house of the Father. Uh, and uh, then he says, uh, again, another conditional, conditional sentence with the at on. Uh, if I go and I prepare a place, again, that image of place, one, repeated again, for you, I am coming again. And I will take you, future tense, um, uh, with me in order that where I am, and the emphasis, obviously, the emphatic personal pronoun. Now you have another emphatic pronoun. You will be also. So the, uh, the, the stress is that he has gone to prepare a place, but he will also bring us safely to that place uh, that he has prepared. Um, and here, the future tense, uh, you know, I will bring this, uh, I will bring you to where, um, to that place, where I am, you will be also. And then, verse 4, uh, it continues, and where, where I am going, you know the way. So, you know the way. This is a very important term. We'll see it a little bit later. Uh, we see it here again. Uh, but this image of the way is uh, probably the dominant uh, a word in terms of Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. It's especially this theme. We'll see this uh, uh, in these verses that's, that's dominant. You know the way uh, where I am, I am going. But Thomas answers and says, Lord, it's a, a statement of faith in the vocative, uh, we do not know. So 
he is contrasting what Jesus has just said. He said, we don't know where you are um, off to, where you are, are, are leading. How are we able to know the way? So there's a little puzzlement with Thomas. We see Thomas playing an important role at several places, and John here is one of the, the key questions he asks. We saw it in the resurrection narrative where there's this, uh, the doubting of Jesus' uh, resurrection. Here, the questioning of exactly what is the way um, to the place, to the Father's place. And then you have this beautiful thematic verse for, for this whole section. One might say this is a, going to be the focus of your preaching, where you have Jesus saying, and then the ego I me saying with the predicate, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, in terms of the Jewish background, one would say that it's, it's probable that uh, a lot of first century Jews believe that the Torah was the way, the truth, and the the source of life. So Jesus is sort of contrasting how people are sometimes interpreting the Old Testament, not seeing the gracious, saving God there that is none other than him, and instead using the Torah uh, in an improper way, in the sense of as just a guidance for how they live their, their, their life and seeking to, to be obedient to God. Um, and um, in a, you know, uh, find a, a righteousness through works. Well, Jesus is saying, I am the way. The Torah really points to me. You know, if you look at uh, the Old Testament, it's pointing to me. Through me, you have the way to the Father. You have fellowship with the Father. You find the truth revealed, and you have the life that's only found in God, who is the source of life. It's a very rich um, statement in terms of Jesus is the only way of salvation. You have in wider society the emphasis that there are, are many paths to God uh, and that there's legitimacy to all these paths. That's not the biblical message. The biblical message is there is only one path to the one true God, and that's through faith in Jesus. He is the way. He is the only uh, true God. He is the only one who can offer life because he is the author of life, the creator. And then that's restated beautifully. Uh, again, another part that you would, you would want to preach very centrally in any homily, no one, there's no other way. No one comes to the Father. Here you have the beautiful Trinitarian language brought out. Um, it, I may, if not literally, uh, we would in English say, Except, except through me. And there you have that instrumental uh, preposition. Uh, so it's just as you can only enter into the sheepfold through Jesus, uh, you can only enter into fellowship um, uh, through faith in Jesus, fellowship with the Father. No one comes to the Father but by me. There's no other way of salvation except uh, in Jesus, through faith in him and what he has done through his life, death, and resurrection. Then in verse 7, uh, he continues, um, if you knew me, and that's the uh, imagery of uh, faith, you know, whenever you have the language of knowing in the Gospel of John, here it's again another conditional sentence, if you knew me, you uh, would know the Father. Uh, the on is not here, which we usually expect in a contrary to fact, but it, it, uh, this, the structure is really, one might say, a contrary to fact, even though you would expect an on in the apodosis, the second half of the sentence. If you knew me, you would know the Father. But right now, you have some question about it, obviously speaking to, to uh, Thomas in light of his question. But then he says, um, but from now on, namely, I am enlightening you, I am teaching you, from now on, you know, present tense, him, namely, the Father, and have seen him. Why do you know the Father and have seen the Father? Because you've seen me, and you come to know the Father through me, and hearing me. 
you come to, he to hear the Father. So what Jesus, the key thing that is being stressed here is Jesus' words are the words of the Father and Jesus' works are the works of the Father. What he sees the Father doing, he does. What he hears the Father saying, he says. So when you see Jesus and when you hear Jesus, you are seeing the Father and hearing the Father. That's a big theme uh, here, and uh, it's uh, being introduced. Now, you have Philip, another one. We've just saw Thomas. This is uh, one of the classic um, uh, uh, questions or request in the Gospel of John. He also speaks in faith, Lord. But then he has this question, the imperative, show to us the Father. Okay, Jesus is just talking about it, and obviously Philip doesn't get it. Um, and Philip says, and that will be sufficient for you. Now the background for this is Exodus 33 where Moses asked to see God, and then you have that famous scene where God takes on the form of a human being, passes by Moses, Moses sees his backside. But Moses was told by God before that happened, you cannot see me and live. So you're not going to see my unveiled presence. You're going to see my veiled presence. I'll take on a human form and pass before you, but you can't see my unveiled presence, otherwise you will die. And so you have Philip asking a similar thing that Moses does. But, but uh, notice how Jesus then responds. You have uh, Jesus, subject here, says to him, namely to uh, uh, Philip, but Philip really, on behalf of all the people that, uh, who seem that, that, that seeing Jesus isn't quite enough. This is a widespread problem. People think, Jesus is the backup quarterback. We want to see the first string quarterback uh, in the game. Well, Jesus is not the backup quarterback. He is the first string quarterback, and you know the Father only through him. He's not just a, some kind of substitute for the Father. You, his words and his works are the, works of the words and works of the Father. So Jesus says, uh, you have been, uh, I am with you, uh, all this time, so I am with you all this time, and you do not know, and again, that's a language of faith, you don't know me, Philip? It's a very indicting question. Um, and then uh, a very uh, profound statement that's, uh, that uh, is very central to this whole text also. The one seeing me has seen Again, the one who has seen me, perfect tense, has seen, perfect tense, the Father. So, uh, this gets back. If you have seen the Jesus in action, you have seen, really, the Father. Because Jesus perfectly reflects the Father's actions. If you've heard the words of Jesus, you have heard the very voice of the Father. Because Jesus' words are perfectly congruent with the works, words of the Father. And so, the one who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus isn't some kind of poor substitute. We come to know the Father's love, the Father's heart. We come to know the Father's actions in the Son. Um, if somebody looks at my son, they will say, hey, that's obviously Dr. Gieschen's uh, son because he looks like him. Uh, he has some of the mannerisms of him. Well, this is even more prominent in terms of the Father-Son relationship within the Trinity. Uh, to, when you know the Son, you really know the Father. There's a perfect congruence. And thus, uh, we don't have to say, boy, uh, I want to climb up to heaven to see what God is. Because when we see Jesus, as we do through the Gospels, we really know the fullness of God. We know who the God of Israel is. We know the Father. Uh, then he goes, how is it that you say, show uh, to us the Father? Namely, you don't get this point. Uh, the one who has seen me has seen the Father. And then, again, some more convictions. Do you not believe, again, he is, he is pressing Philip here. Do you not believe that I am in the Father, the Trinitarian unity that's being spoken of? 
The Son being united with the Father and the Father being united with the Son is beautifully expressed here. That I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Uh, the unity of the, the, the Father-Son relationship beautifully expressed here. Why don't we scroll up here in the middle of verse 10 and then we'll uh, catch these last four verses, five verses. So, uh, he goes on in verse, uh, middle of verse 10, the words which I speak, which I am saying to you, um, I am not saying from myself. Remember I pointed out a little bit earlier, it's not only Jesus' works, but also all of his words are words from the Father. He doesn't just say what he wants to say, he says what he hears the Father saying. That's being brought out beautifully here. Uh, you have the plural of rhema, rhemata. So the words which I am saying to you, I am saying uh, not from myself. I am not saying them just on my own accord. Uh, the, the, uh, and then uh, the, the Father who remains in me, you have this uh, participle here, Meno is a very important uh, verb in Gospel of John, but uh, the Father, so who is remaining in me, is doing, now Jesus is picking up with this theme of the works, is doing his works. So, namely, in Jesus, you see the Father's at works. Why? Because Jesus sees what the Father is doing and he does that. Uh, so you have the, the unity of the Father and the Son expressed and the fact that when you see then the works of the Father, uh, it is uh, uh, the works of Jesus are none other than the works of the Father, even as his words are none other than the Father's words. And then verse 11 continues, You believe me that, um, that uh, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Uh, if not, according to, uh, uh, then if you don't believe that, at least believe on account of the works. These works, which, uh, so believe on account of the works. So even if you're struggling with recognizing that my words are the words of the Father, at least look at what I'm doing. These are none other than the divine works of Yahweh. That's what Jesus is saying. Um, and so if you've seen my works, you've seen the Father's works. You've seen the Father. Uh, and obviously the climactic work Jesus is going to do that reveals the Father is his death and uh, his resurrection, but especially his self-giving death on the cross. That shows the key work of, of the Father in, the, in, in handing over the Son for our salvation. God so loved the world. Obviously, um, John chapter 3.16 unpacks that. And then finally, another one of these amen, 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 calling our attention. The one believing, you have the participle, in my works, the works of me. So in me, uh, excuse me, the, the one believing in me, that's the uh, object, um, the works which I am doing, that one will do. So not only does Jesus do the works of the Father, but then we do the works of Jesus. Why? Because of our union with him. So they will do, and greater, you have the, the comparative adjective here, than, than these things he will do. So Jesus is speaking about the future mission. He's going to give his spirit. He's going to empower us to do great works in terms of, of through the proclamation of the gospel, through baptism, so that Jesus' saving work can be brought into the lives of so many other. Beautiful part of the mission of this text. Wonderful to trumpet during the Easter season. Uh, why? Because I am going to the Father. And here you have Jesus really setting up uh, Ascension Day, uh, and also then the assurance of, of Pentecost in the sense of that he will empower the church uh, through the Spirit. But 
the fact that he's going to the Father, it's something we celebrate the 40 days, uh, 40th day after uh, the resurrection, Jesus ascends to the Father. In the Gospel of John, it doesn't talk about it as an ascension, just it talks about it as the going to the Father. Uh, and uh, you have in, in verse 13, you have, uh, and whatever uh, you ask, so you have this uh, on, so subjunctive verb, so whatever you ask or request in my name, and again, this is setting up once Jesus is ascended, uh, and we are asking things in his name, here I would emphasize it isn't just a matter of using the personal name, Jesus. Remember, the unique name of Jesus is actually that he shares the divine name, Yahweh. So asking things in his name is believing specifically who Jesus is, that Jesus is Yahweh, or another way we express it, Jesus is Lord. So when I ask things in the, in, in the name of Jesus, he says, my name, it's the special name he shares. I ask things believing who Jesus is, that he is none other than Yahweh. So uh, this I will do. So the assurance is when we ask things believing that Jesus is Lord, that he is Yahweh, Jesus will deliver on that. Uh, in order that the Father be glorified, be, be uh, uh, you know, shown forth in the Son. Uh, and there again, the Trinitarian um, uh, relationship is, is emphasized. That uh, through what, what we ask, the, fa the, the, uh, the Son does, and then who is um, shown, not only just the Son, but through that action, we, the Father is revealed. So it's not only from the believer, to the Son, but it's from the Son to the Father. Uh, and then finally, this last conditional sense, sentence, if you ask, eon plus the subjunctive, me, uh, uh, in my name, same kind of uh, phrase we just talked about here, namely, in believing that Jesus is Yahweh, I will do it. So just restating that same promise, here, future more vivid conditional, the assurance he will deliver. And again, uh, why is this all brought up? Because he's going to the Father. And so we will make these requests. He will continue to be active in our lives. That's part of the promise. So may the Lord bless your proclamation of uh, this text uh, during this joyous Easter season. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.